Uh, the webinar today is designing your outdoor classroom. So hopefully you're in the right place uh, on this lovely Wednesday late afternoon. I'm just going to go ahead and bring up my screen. And there we go. Got that all set. Okay. So um, again, this is Designing Your Outdoor Classroom. I'm Marilyn Wiska, uh, and I'll introduce myself in just a moment. I just want you to take in that picture since we'll be visiting this particular schoolyard quite a bit as we go through the next hour. There we go. All right, great. So um, I was a wildlife educator for New Hampshire Fish and Game Department for quite a few years. And during that time, had the opportunity and the privilege to create Project Home, which is a schoolyard habitat program that spread across the country. Uh, so I've worked with a lot of different schools and communities, mostly here in New Hampshire, but in other places as well. Uh, and have worked as a landscape designer and an educator in other capacities along with that. Uh, there is a guide or was a guide with Project Home called Homes for Wildlife. It was a guide to habitat enhancement on school grounds. There are still copies of it kind of kicking around. So uh, that's me. And here's what's going to happen over the next hour. Um, no matter what size schoolyard you've got, right, you have the potential for authentic outdoor learning experiences. Right. So whether your hope is for there to be a meadow in your school grounds, um, whether you're looking to create some raised beds in a small area of the schoolyard, uh, if you've got a woodland and you want to have a lean-to that you're going to have your outdoor classroom studies happening in, whether you're considering a native plant restoration area in a corner of the school grounds, or if you've got plans for a small pocket garden for pollinators and for birds, um, or perhaps some sort of staging area or gathering space for your students. All of these are possible. They're all obviously different scope and scale, uh, and they'll all follow the same progression from start to finish, ideally. Walk, and I'll walk you through those steps for designing, creating, and establishing an outdoor classroom that is appropriate to your site and serves your needs for learning. I'm going to suggest a range of possibilities as we go through. So you just saw a little demonstration of that right there in that collage. And I'm going to focus primarily on the Gilmanton Elementary School to demonstrate the process. That's just for a couple of reasons. The Gilmanton project included an entire courtyard. And within that courtyard are a number of outdoor classroom features that could be the single feature that you have in your space. So it gives us a lot of variety to work with. It's also the most recent project that uh, I was involved with and it's still in progress. So they're just still getting all that established. Obviously COVID kind of interrupted that a little bit. So I want to find out um, who is here and what's going on. So with that said, we've got a few uh, polls for you uh, so we can get an, an idea of who's gathered here for this webinar. So if Leanne, you can pop that first one up. That'd be great. And if you all could choose the answer that best describes you. Gonna find out who all these others are. All right, so leaning towards elementary more than middle school. All right, those of you who answered other, if you would be willing to write into the chat box uh, what other you are. That would be really helpful. And there's the, there we go, it's chat box. 
uh, early childhood education, environmental educator, director of a nature preschool. Okay, some more early childhood. All right. Pre-K teacher. Okay. There's the category I forgot. I apologize for skipping that one as you put the poll together. That was an obvious one. Okay. Super. I'm having kind of a an odd experience with my cursor not being visible. So we'll just have to go ahead. Uh, Leanne, could you put up the second poll? So seeing that there is some in progress, some outdoor classrooms, some that are still the germ of an idea, um, a few that are established and in use. Wow, it's a pretty good spread across the board. And no surprise, at least one that um, our school had one and nobody uses it anymore. Okay, great. So we've mostly got them in progress. Okay, terrific. And then the third poll. Okay, a few yeses on that one. And mostly no. All right. Well, then there's a whole lot of potential uh, for you all to be applying for those. Great. Thank you so much for filling that out. The other piece of this is questions and answers. So if you would be so good as to write questions into the chat box as we're proceeding, I'll stop at least once to see if there's anything that really jumps out that I don't feel like are really answered. Uh, and then the rest we'll just look at at the end and depending on whether it's something I can just answer straight up from the question or whether we need to unmute you to get you to participate and ask the question live, we'll do that. Okay, great. So here we go. I'm gonna just drop back out of this for a moment. There we go. And come back in. Oh, my apologies. I'm not sure why my cursor disappears when I run the PowerPoint, but there you go. All right, so here's steps to creating your outdoor classroom. So before I jump in and lay out all those steps for you, especially because we've got enough folks who have created an outdoor classroom of some kind, if you would be so good as just type into the chat box what are some of the steps along the process from it being first a germ of an idea and then getting into something that you're actively using? Draw plans, have access to water, uh, doing an assessment with kids, building community by not going it alone. Thank you. Yes. Okay, um, a few other thoughts, polling the teachers for needs and wants. Collaboration, safety considerations. Engaging students from the beginning. Yes, yes. Uh, broad idea, bring kids out to the sp oh, bring kids outside to the space, getting their ideas, bring a team of teachers together, have the kids partake in the art, the building, the planting, or revealing it to the community, discuss the purpose of the space. Mm-hmm. Research, speaking with like-minded community, what worked for them, getting the kids input. Okay, super. Okay, great. Let's see if I can just 
once again make this go away. Hmm, there's got to be an answer to this. I'm going to apologize again for popping out of that. Just there we go. I did it. Okay, great. So here are the steps um, as I've worked with them to lead schools through this process. And a bunch of these you touched on already. Um, so sight sense, being aware of what's out there on the site already, bringing together a team, a number of you commented on like-minded people, community support, uh, collecting lots of data about the site. And this is so, so critical. So we'll really look at each of these in de detail what the scope and the possibilities are. Are you talking about a site that's, you know, just a, a quarter of an acre um, or a half an acre or an acre? Is it um, 10 acres? Uh, do you have a, a wood lot next to your school? All of these kinds of things are going to influence what you can do. Um, design, obviously. That's what we're here for. Um, looking at funding and other resources, completing an installation, maintaining and growing. So having care for that space, as well as thinking about ways that it could develop some more. And then using it. This is what it's all about. Uh, using it informs a lot of the following steps, which keeps looping back around to exploring new ideas, incorporating them, installing, maintaining, growing, etc. And not forgetting to celebrate the success when you arrive um, at completion of each of those kinds of steps. Alrighty, so site sense, right? Spending time in the site to get familiar with it. Uh, and this is important from your perspective as the adult, but even more so from the perspective of the students. They know so much about what's out there. They have names for places and things on the school grounds that might not be what you refer to them as. Uh, they know how they use that space. That might not be how the adults intended that space to be used. So starting with their sensory awareness experience, and especially for all of you who are working with younger students, uh, the, the pre-K group, the, the kindergarten group, the first graders, uh, and second graders, especially having that opportunity to explore with their hands, with their ears, with their eyes, with their noses, in some cases um, by tasting. All right, so team, if you would all be so good as to pop into the chat box and write who are some of the people who ought to be on a team, um, or if you created a, a project like this already, um, who is on the team that you brought together? Cohorts, principal, librarian, local gardeners club, lead teachers, administrators, awesome, local plant nursery. Teachers, parents, custodians, environmental group, volunteer builders, school leaders, teachers, parents, kids. Okay, great. Ah, still not allowed to have volunteers on the site. Yes, that that time will come. All right, looks like we're we're pretty well covering all of that. So, folks that you mentioned, teachers, obviously, I think a lot of you are in that particular role. Um, having students involved, they are the core of the project, right? If this is about their learning. It's about them making those curriculum connections. And the more ownership that they can have of this site and this outdoor classroom, of the features on it, the more that they will be supportive of what's happening in that outdoor learning space. Um, the, as they start to identify features to have on this site, you know, you could have 50 kids in your in your school say that they want a tree. And if there's a tree that's planted out there, all 50 of them will claim that that was because they put it into their plan. Um, so making sure that they are right at the heart of it. And then you'll also be bringing all the adults along. 
The administrator, very critical for obvious reasons, permissions, uh, getting uh, support and resources, knowing what your safety parameters are and liability concerns. Parents, perfect allies. Um, they're going to be in there working with the students and they have a plethora of skill sets uh, to be able to offer to this project. Superintendent might be somebody that you want to involve. Skilled folks of all kinds from your community and then other community members, possibly some um, seniors who might live nearby and would be there as mentors and support. Uh, that's just, just one example. Uh, environmental uh, resource professionals was another one that came up as folks were going through. Okay. So in a nutshell, as we go forward, I mentioned the scope and the scale of the project is going to influence the scope and the scale of all of the elements that we're addressing. And it all comes down to what do we have? What do we want? And how are we going to get it? simple breakdown of those three steps. So site data is where you're going to find out what it is that you have. You're going to collect as much information as you can about the site and it's starting from that sensory experience. So having first maps is really key. You need to know the size and shape and configuration of the building. If there are any plans for new new as uh, new parts of the building, new extensions to be built, uh, temporary classroom space, anything that's on the horizon that might come in and use up some of the space that you've got in mind for an outdoor classroom. Uh, so having access to those site plans, to tax maps, which will show you what the boundaries of the property are, um, to soils maps, which are going to tell you what your soils are like, and that indicates the drainage and what you're going to be able to plant in that area and how hard it might be to dig into that ground. Um, you'll notice in this map of the Gilmanton Elementary School, in particular, there are a bunch of dark squares, one, two, three, four, at least five of them connected by little dots. Those are drains. The dots are pipes. So obviously it was really key that we know where those were, how they were all connected, and how far beneath the surface they were as we went about digging. And the one drain that's in the top, uh, in that row of circles, which were trees, was also really critical because that's where the snow is piled and it melts down through the drain. So no matter what we did in that space, we had to make sure that there was still access to that drain so that that could happen. Uh, some of the other things that are happening here in these pictures are you know, measurements of spaces and also testing the soil. That's a soil test pit uh, using buckets of water to drain into the soil uh, and then assessing uh, how much sand, silt, or clay would likely be there based on the way that it drains out. And then teacher professional development workshops um, are a way to provide, huh, that's funny, um, <laughs> that wasn't supposed to be animated, way to provide skill development, uh, things like soil identification, learning mapping, as in plain table mapping with this group of teachers here. Uh, the teachers in the upper right hand corner are doing colors and words matching. Uh, so that was part of a workshop as well. So seeking out these opportunities as a way to enhance your skill set that you can then bring onto the project and provide to the group as you build your design. These are a few examples of maps created by teachers of the school grounds. The largest one is using satellite imagery as a reference for laying out the map so that things are to relative scale um, and then building in information about the grounds from their own studies. So uh, applying the data, the investigation data, the inventory data to the surface of the map. And the one in the top right corner is a sketch map, pretty straightforward. The one on the, on the bottom right is using graph paper uh, grids to work out that plan to scale. Part of the reason that I'm emphasizing this 
is we, I'm part of the group, the New Hampshire Partnership for Schoolyard Action, and we provide grants once a year for these kinds of outdoor classrooms. Without a good map, it's really hard for us to understand the project. And a good map also demonstrates to us as the grantors that you really understand the site and you're really investigating it and have to collect the, the relevant information for it. So having a good idea about how to prepare maps from simple sketch maps all the way to using other um, more complex map technologies, especially if you've got older students. Scope and possibilities. So your next step is to dream up all the things that you would like to have in this schoolyard. The list that you're seeing in front of you was put together by the Gilmanton teachers and their students and the members of the committee. So they polled everyone, winnowed down the list to the ones that got a lot of uh, repeat support and then did a, a poll to work through the list and kind of narrow it further. Uh, and you'll, you'll see that pretty much all of these are in development on their grounds as we speak. So in your case, identifying that group of stakeholders, knowing who they are, getting all of their ideas and collecting them in one place. This is going to allow you to take all of that information, the goals, uh, sorry, the, the site data, the map, the dreams, the wish list, and from that you create your master plan, right? Your goals, your objectives, your project ideas, and moving it forward from there. Having a central place to keep all of this information is essential because you don't know if you're going to continue to be at the school. Uh, you want to make sure all of those records stay accessible to anybody who is on the team who's going to be carrying this project forward. All right. And then before we go into design, I'm just going to stop screen sharing. Whoops, there we go. Okay, great. And I'm gonna check to see if there are questions that I can answer right off the bat. Uh, that might be related to things we've already covered. So there's our participants, just scan and look for question marks. We received a grant for, uh, do you recommend raised gardens or, oh, okay. Well, this is a good question. So um, Keith is asking about this, this grant for $1,200 for a pollinator garden. Do I recommend raised beds or using ground level gardens? Me personally, um, I would say ground level gardens. And this is for a couple of reasons. If you're establishing a pollinator garden, you're likely using native plants. Native plants for pollinators uh, tend to, um, they're gonna be following the seasons. So when you have a raised bed, then the soil that's in there is going to warm up faster and dry out sooner. And having those plants down in the ground just kind of keeps them consistent with the seasons. Uh, I know that raised beds are a real benefit for kids being able to access the what's what's in the bed. Uh, so it could be an interesting experiment. You know, here's a place for study and investigation, uh, having um, a little bit of both and doing a comparison about when those plants emerge, when they bloom, uh, which ones are getting used by the pollinators that you intended to be using them at a particular time. And just pan out so our postponed twice so kids create it. Ah, okay, good. I'm gonna get to that, Katie, um, about getting the kids to come through the process as well. So we'll, we'll definitely be touching on that uh, and not seeing any other questions at the moment. I'm gonna go back to sharing my screen. And back to, okay, there we go. So design, 
Uh, and here's, here's the crux of it. You've pulled together all of this information, all of these ideas. You've got goals, you've got objectives, you've got somewhat place that you're starting to head. Now you need to be able to pull it together and make it fit the space or work with the space that you have available. So one of the play ways to do that is to have students start to create images, drawings of what they see on the space. And you'll find depending on what age they are, some of those will be pictorial and some of them will be more in a map format. And you can see that on the, the right hand side. Um, and then drawing, bringing it into um, like sketch maps as in the top and moving that on to a more refined map, which is off to the left, uh, as you begin to solidify these plans. So the, the pictures on the right, actually all of these are from Gilmanton Elementary School. They had the entire K through eight population draw a picture of what they wanted to see on the grounds. Another way to get students involved in designing the space is once you winnow down that wish list, you can give them a handful of those items. So especially if you're working with a smaller space, this particular site is the Mount Lebanon Elementary School. Uh, the space was smaller than at Gilmanton and the students had, I think a list of maybe five or six items that they had to lay out into this space. Uh, it was a little bit, more straightforward from a design point of view because the land was completely flat. We were building berms as we went along. So it was a little bit more accessible to them. Um, but they're, they're building design skills. Uh, they're working through the drafting process. They're figuring out uh, the sizes of objects relative to each other. Younger students can do this with three-dimensional models. So these are just sand table models with lots of bits and parts, uh, and they worked in pairs. So each of them working on an, uh, an opposite end of this tray, uh, just to express how they were visualizing the space after it had everything in place for their, out, um, their ideal outdoor classroom. And then once you've got all of these components, once you've got all their drawings, uh, once you've got all their models and imagery, putting it someplace where the public can view it. So this is the Gilmanton School's uh, sort of welcoming wall case. Most a lot of schools have, have bulletin boards in the same place. They just filled it with all of these images. And that's a way to get the public, the parents, the community, the other teachers, the staff to be aware of what's going on, and then also to, um, to become involved, to get excited about this uh, and want to find out more and offer their particular skills. Whether they've got skills in grant writing, boy, that's a good one. Uh, if they happen to be a botanist and that's in their background, if they're skilled carpenters, uh, if they um, work with construction um, or earth moving um, or pond building, all of those things can be real assets. And if they simply wanted to be able to donate their time and their labor to working on these. And then uh, in the bottom of that case, those gray objects are 3D models that the seventh and eighth graders created. So they, they built the school from a computer 3D modeling. From there, you have the option, and again, it depends on the scale, the scope, the complexity, to determine your best approach. You might seek in-house skills. In the case of the Kelly School in Newburyport, Massachusetts, they happened to discover that somebody who was working part-time in their main office was a landscape designer. And so she was able to take all of their ideas and put it into plan form. It was a smaller space, mostly a shade garden alongside the school. 
uh, you then there's the whole the whole range of moving from there into a professional designer. So these are the these are the designs that I created for the Gilmanton Elementary School. Uh, there's a sketch, the one that's got an A on it. Uh, we were going through a bunch of different possibilities. I brought three of them to the committee. They chose which one they liked best. That's the one that got developed into the color image you see, which was used for a parent and community night to talk about the project, to solicit the support, um, to be able to start thinking about funding and resources. And then the last one is a, a more refined design to scale uh, with all of the features in place. All right, so as you're going through all of this, right, as the plan is evolving, still use the space. I really encourage you to still be out there. In the case of Gilmanton, they made labels, they made little signs for each of the areas that they were starting to craft, to shape, to design. Uh, this one says pondless waterfall. The one in the background is the reading garden. That's an opportunity to remind people where all these things are happening. It also allows you to physically fit the space, right? You don't know how big a gazebo or a terrace for a classroom of first graders needs to be until you've got them all sitting together on the ground or on chairs, whatever it is you're gonna be sitting on in that space. Um, and so you can get a, um, relative scale right, for figuring out all of these places. And you can see from the other two pictures that uh, before we started the design process and as the design evolved, they were using it as an outdoor classroom simply with picnic tables, right, that just a place to sit, to write, to draw, to collect information. Uh, Helen Ross Russell in her book from, I think it was from the 70s and 10 minute field trips, really proved that for an outdoor classroom, you don't need anything except you, you and your students. And she was taking kids out onto the sidewalk at in their New York school and looking at the cracks in the sidewalk for what was present there, for the weeds that grew there, for any insect life that might be present. Um, so making use of what you've got as you are developing this grander plan. And then the other um, picture shows a weather station. You can see that white box attached to the top of a post. Uh, so that had already been in place uh, and was being used by the students. All right, and then, and then funding. So as I've mentioned already, um, I'm part of the New Hampshire Partnership for Schoolyard Action. The, there are four organizations that came together to create this partnership because they discovered that they were all separately providing funding for outdoor classrooms. And that is New Hampshire Audubon, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, New Hampshire Project Learning Tree, and New Hampshire Fish and Game Department. And those grant proposals are due in January. We just sent out letters to the next group of recipients. You can see the little marks on the map there for um, places, schools that received the funding. So that's just one example. Resources can come in lots of different shapes. So if you've got high school students or middle school students who are working in a shop, they can build tables, they can build um, seating, uh, they can build structures for the site, and there's a resource, there's something you need that's being provided. Getting items uh, that are donated, getting items that are discounted, uh, whether for uh, temporary use, um, like a bobcat to move earth on the day that you're moving earth around, um, or something that you're getting to plant. Uh, those are a lot easier for businesses to offer than cash. Um, so finding in-kind kind of contributions. The Gilmanton Elementary School is one of the dots on that, uh, on that map since they received a grant both for design and for installation. 
I'd also encourage you to get creative. Uh, there was a school that I worked with that got funding from the Library Association that they used to purchase reference books, like field guides for their library. Uh, there was another that got a grant from um, an optometrist's association, and they were using it for a sun shelter to protect kids' um, eyes from the strong sun. Um, so that was creative use of, of the grant. All right, and then the installation comes along. So you have the option of looking at your whole school space and coming up with a master plan that covers all of it and gradually installing a piece at a time. And I really strongly recommend piece at a time, right? Let it be a work in progress. Um, or you can focus on, as we talked before, these smaller spaces, right? Like this particular corner uh, along the northwestern wall of the courtyard uh, was a place that they established a bird and pollinator area. And it's all anchored by that one spruce tree that was remaining. The area also had burning bush in it, which uh, they're great they're great for supporting wildlife. They're unfortunately invasive species. So those got pulled out um, and these other plant materials put in. Uh, there will be bird feeders in addition to the plants that are providing the food for the pollinators and for the birds. So the, the students got really involved uh, with this project and yours can too. Um, I hate to say yes, use them for heavy labor, but they really want to be hands-on with this. So finding the kinds of tasks that they can do. And in the case of Gilmanton, you know, here's younger elementary school kids who are moving buckets of gravel to fill this trough that then became the paved path. That's one of the access places to the gazebo. Um, you see the tunnel going into place. Uh, that was another access into the outdoor classroom. So there were three styles of access points uh, to allow different experiences and to also serve different populations. And more of these things going in, paths and trees and trellises and raised beds. Uh, you've got students wielding power tools. Uh, I think that that's perfectly wonderful idea uh, that they are, they're learning a skill, um, they're working hands on and they're helping to make this idea, all their ideas, a uh, reality. Another way to come at the installation um, is an idea that came from the Peter Woodbury School uh, in, um, oh dear, near Manchester, Bedford. Um, and they had a plant purchasing day. So parents had the option of buying a plant in their student's name, anything from um, a single potted perennial all the way up to a tree. And they arrived on a particular day. There was a plan set out. They came and acquired their plant. They were shown where it was going to go on the ground. Um, they brought their tools or tools were provided. And so there was this whole planting day. Uh, and a lot of that plant material got set into the ground uh, all at once, all on one wonderful Saturday. Uh, and another example of a small corner idea, that was one piece of the uh, courtyard that Gilmanton is establishing. That wall to the left is the Northeastern wall um, and that, so intersecting with the <laughs> southeastern wall. Uh, so a somewhat, somewhat shady, um, uh, somewhat sunny corner that they wanted to use for a reading garden. And you can see how the parts of that went into place. Uh, that those pavers, uh, in this, this case, they had a professional team install them. I'm sure there are some of you out there who have installed similar things on your own property. 
Uh, it's pretty straightforward putting papers into place. There will be uh, seeding of different kinds. You can see the rocks that are already placed. There are uh, logs that are already there. And that post is gonna hold a little uh, outdoor library of the kind that we see kind of cropping up in, in towns and uh, just with like a, a sharing library to be able to pull a book out uh, and use it there in the space. And finally, maintaining and growing, right? This is the part that uh, we, we tend to shy away from, maintenance of any kind. Uh, in this case, you're seeing a picture of that north corner of the courtyard where there is an entrance. So the windows that you see are the office looking out onto that planted area, which was primarily American holly and hostas. Um, but you can see those bittersweet vines kind of waving around out of the top. Uh, those were all removed. Um, Christmas fern was added into there as well as some other shade loving plants uh, that would be suitable for that space and then also support pollinators. So remembering that things need to be watered, they need to be weeded, um, and ideally you're adding, you're adding to a space over time. So as you're working with it, um, as you're keeping the whatever's out there functional and structurally sound and healthy, it'll generate ideas for new growth. And of course, plants don't necessarily survive uh, with the funky winters we've been having. A lot of shrubs have been taking a hit. Uh, so having anticipating replacing those um, and then being able to establish additional plants along with. And then the final part of that, of course, is using it, right? Make this outdoor classroom come alive. Um, you can do field investigations. You can have quiet reflection and study. Uh, there's an example of a wonderful piece of artwork that was done at the Mount Lebanon School in their garden, um, using that area for inspiration uh, all the way across all of the disciplines. And you can incorporate the maintenance into this learning in order to be able to keep plants healthy and remove the plants that you didn't intend to be there, the AKA weeds. Uh, you need to know what they look like, right? You need, you need to know which ones are the plants that we wanted and which ones are the plants that we didn't want, um, which is something I learned pretty quick when I was 10 years old and pulled out all my dad's lily bulbs. Uh, so it's, it's a good thing to know, right? To be able to learn your learning uh, plant identification, observation skills, etc. And then organizing and scheduling folks from your team or from the community to conduct regular maintenance. The Cornucopia Project works with the Conval School District in vegetable gardens in eight different schools. Those gardens are maintained by a crew of parents and community members who water, weed, and harvest and in exchange get to take home whatever produce is ready that particular week. Okay. And then just wrapping up this segment with some pictures from the Gilmanton classroom, outdoor classrooms courtyard uh, as it went into establishment last summer um, a little bit into the fall. So you can see that bird area off to the left with the spruce. There's the gazebo in center, the reading area off there to the back right corner. These different paths coming in and out, the tunnel there with the soil mound. Another view looking into the courtyard. Uh, I love that they chose this popping blue color for the raised beds for the vegetable garden area. Um, brings a little spark of a different kind, especially when things are not green and in bloom. And these trellises, you can see this one here. There's one out towards that back right corner. Uh, the team wanted to make sure that this space was recognized as an outdoor classroom and not confused with, for instance, the playground that you can see in the background. So all along the perimeter, 
there will be plant material uh, that provides a barrier from this paved area. And the access points will be through these trellises, through the tunnel, along the pathways, um, except for the one place we're figuring out where the, um, the snow is continuing to be stacked. One more view. All right, and finally, celebrating your success as you move along. These are enormous um, additions, wonderful additions to your school grounds. And so no matter how small or how large they are, celebrating them at all the different points of success and sharing that with the community. Um, so there's my information on that last slide as well as the link for the grants. So that as you're developing your project through this year, you get around to next January, you'll be able to apply uh, and get some additional support for your schoolyard. So with that, I'm gonna escape from that, stop the sharing and come on back to the chat box. All right, well, all right, so I'm gonna flip through these again and look for questions. Uh, and then depending on what we've got here, if there aren't a lot of questions happening in the chat box, then we can open it up to maybe people um, raising hands to ask live. All right, so folks are asking about the presentation and it is being recorded and will be posted online so you'll have access to it. And where is the grant link? Uh, that was on the last slide of the PowerPoint. Um, I don't know if Leanne can pull that up. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm looking for it right now. I'll Great, thanks. It's on the Fish and Game website, um, so wildlife.nh.gov. All right, so I'm not seeing more questions. So I'm just gonna put this out to you folks. If somebody has a question, and you want to unmute yourself and ask, we can do that live. Marilyn, someone did just ask, where did you get the tunnel? You know, that would have, that would be a question directly for the Gilmington School. Erin Hollingsworth was the lead teacher on that project. The way that I had designed it was as a plant tunnel. So I was recommending vining plants that would go up and over a tubular trellis, uh, and then they would, you know, die back. And it was just, it was another place where you're getting uh, pollinator food and bird food uh, and like a shady space that was a living tunnel. They opted for the, um, the constructed tunnel instead. Yeah. And I know somebody had asked prior to the webinar um, about ideas for middle school students uh, since they already had several, um, here we go, pull this up. They already had outdoor spaces in place like a lecture space, butterfly garden, vegetable and herb garden. Um, and certainly one of the things that I would recommend is a weather station, getting some real uh, weather tools, for instance, through the UNH um, GLOBE program, so they can help to make those available or give you a list of the, the components, um, and that would be really suitable to that age group. And it also depends on what, what their curriculum is, right, what their, um, what their learning what goals you have for them, 
uh, what the topics are, what kinds of field investigations would be appropriate, and then generating something for the outdoor classroom around that. I suspect that they would have plenty of ideas for you. Yeah. Marilyn? Yes. For the, um, I, I was the one who asked about raised beds versus uh, lo low level. Um, we were lucky enough at Lincoln Street School in Exeter to uh, receive uh, the $1,200. And I've done a little bit of research and listening to others uh, that are experts on, you know, the pollinator pathways and the pollinator gardens to mm -hmm. focus on, you know, three seasons of food and habitat for the butterflies. Do you think just that alone at first and then you can always add bird feeders or benches and things like that? Or do you kind of go 100% into it and try to do all these different I'm, I'm yep. just not sure mm -hmm. you yeah. tackle, no, everything at, tackle everything at once or just focus more on the butterflies than anything yep. else. And then there are three seasons. I, What do you think? That's an excellent question. Uh, and it's going to depend on the resources that you have available in terms of people and energy and financial resources and material resources. If you've got the capacity to put everything in at once, and that's what you want to do, um, I would certainly su support doing that. Uh, most schools, I'm encouraging to taking it piecemeal, right, so that they don't get overwhelmed with it. You put one part in and you go, oh, okay, this is working. This is good. Great. Now on to the next one. You've got energy to kind of move on. Um, and in your particular case, I believe that Heidi Holman from Fish and Game is going to be in touch about supporting you with that project and some of the particulars. And I think I might be on that list as okay. well. So we'll... Yeah, that's great. I just knew that um, from the local gardeners club and some others that they said, oh, we'd, we'd love to help out either with men and women power or financially. So there's mm -hmm. more money. I just didn't know. Do you, you know, do you, do you try to go all, all into it with all these different things? Um, but that, but you answered that. So that makes sense. Cause I think we're, we actually are going to have a little bit more money than we thought originally because people are willing to donate. That's great. That's great. And with donations, uh, certainly caution you. A lot of times uh, people will want to donate um, divisions from their gardens. And the reason that they're giving you those particular plants is because they're the kinds of plants that tend to divide and fill up an area. And they may not be what exactly you're looking for. So as people are offering donations, make sure you've got a list of the kinds of plants that you're looking for um, and request those. Great. Yeah. Thanks. Good question. Uh, and then let's see. All right. So there's, yeah. And you're also asking about benches, pathways, bird feeders in a pollinator garden, or just stick to the bushes and flowers. Uh, these outdoor classrooms, like a backyard wildlife habitat, are meant to be used by people. And the value of those pathways into a space is twofold. One is so that you can get in there and do the work that you need to do with maintenance. Yeah. Um, and the other one is so that the students can get up close to things to be able to study them, um, possibly even having seating within that space. So I would definitely encourage uh, bringing the human element into that area. And the one caveat would be the, the very first picture in the slide um, in the webinar, that picture from Peter Woodbury School, which is a big meadow. In a meadow, you may you may or may not have pathways through. You might just leave that as one uh, integral component component of uh, of habitat. Yeah. All right. So, any other questions? Anybody want to unmute and? Fire away. Okay, and hearing nobody and seeing the time, I am gonna share my screen one last time so that you have that last slide that's got my contact information on it in case you um, you weren't able to catch that before. Um, yeah, Tom. 
Uh, and also the link for the New Hampshire Partnership for Employer Action Grants. So with all of that, um, oh, is there one more question? Let's see, open up the chat box. Oh, just a thank you. You're welcome. Absolutely. Thank you everybody for being here this afternoon uh, and for your curiosity about outdoor classrooms. Um, I'm delighted that there's this much activity around them. I know that this has been a really ideal year to be thinking about studying in the landscape because you've been forced to be outdoor learning uh, anyway because of COVID. So as you come up with questions, please feel free to contact me or other members of the partnership. We'd be happy to give you uh, technical assistance and some more direction. Uh, and good luck with all of your projects for outdoor classroom development.